Dr. Pimentel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just was telling the viewers here and, and listeners that, you know, we're going to be talking about something that a lot of people find embarrassing. They don't really want to talk about it. They don't really want to think about it. But your gut health is so important. It's related to so many other things. And before we get going, I want to introduce you. You are Dr. Mark Pimentel. You are an associate professor of medicine and of gastroenterology at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. You're also director of a program that brings together physicians and researchers that are dedicated to really studying the microbiome and what it is and how it can really impact your entire health. So thank you so much for doing this interview. And also you're the author of this book, The Microbiome Connection, Your Guide to IBS, SIBO, and Low Fermentation Eating. Um, I really want to delve into this and, and get to what the core of this is all about. But first, I, I kind of want to start at the beginning. Um, you know, gut health has kind of become this sort of key word or key phrase that you see on the cover of health magazines. And, you know, you really have to focus on your gut health, take probiotics, eat these foods. And, but nobody ever actually really says, what's a healthy gut? What does that mean? So you're the expert. What does health, having a healthy gut mean? Well, thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure um, to talk about my favorite topic, which is the gut microbiome. But, you know, here's the problem. We as scientists still haven't unraveled what exactly is healthy bacteria of the gut. Why do I say that? Because if you think about the micro environment of your gut in, let's say, Italy, if you live in Italy, is different than if you live in the U.S. So there's all sorts of healthy. But, yeah, you know, people are being pushed all sorts of products. This is healthy for your gut. This is not healthy for your gut. Here's, my, here's one of my pet peeves. We have to take good bacteria. Well, there really is no such thing as good bacteria. If they're in the wrong place, they're not good. If they're in the right place, they're good. And so it's a notion that's really good at selling things, but isn't really factually correct about you should be taking good bacteria or the, even the word probiotics suggests that it's good, but it isn't always good. It depends on the situation. Right. Right, we're right. So when you when somebody's kind of evaluating themselves, which many people who are watching this could be right now, kind of saying, "Well, I, gosh, I, I think I have good health." So, so give me an example of what that looks like. Is it is it different for every body? Is it more than just, frankly, your bathroom habits? I mean, give me an example of of what what normal or what good gut health looks like in a person. Well, I think first of all. And, and this is going to be kind of a gross example, but I'm going to okay. use it anyway. We all have dogs and we see what happens, right? <laughs> and, and you, it, sometimes that's the best way to compare. They go to the bathroom once, there's not much they need to do, and they go on with their day. And so that's sort of how we are supposed to be, uh, that we go to the bathroom in the morning and that we don't have bloating, gas, and distension through the day, that we're not trying to loosen our belts, that we're not in the middle of a meeting and then being called, getting the call to go somewhere and do something in a bathroom, that's not normal. And, and, and maybe I'm an overachiever, but that's sort of what we hope to achieve with normal health. But mm -hmm. to get there, I mean, most people fortunately have that benefit, but it, it's, it involves a healthy lifestyle, eating healthy, and also exercise, and, and, and those, those help. But then when disease creeps in, then those things can't compensate. They can't overcome the situation. Right. And I know 70 million, the statistic is 70 million Americans right now are currently living with some sort of gut imbalance, whether it be IBS or SIBO. Now, I know many people probably listening have never heard of SIBO. I've heard of SIBO, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But can you give me kind of an example of, of why some of these things creep up, the IBS, the SIBO, and other gut-related issues, and moving forward, what they can lead to in the future, which is why you should keep an eye on it? Well, I mean, if you go back traditionally, uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it used to be thought of that these chronic intestinal conditions were due to stress or anxiety or depression, mm -hmm. uh, more common in women, and the notion was women were more anxious, and all these myths, which, you know, I've spent 25 years trying to dispel and trying to get rid of, because it's, it's not in your head, it's in your gut, uh, mm -hmm. although there is a connection. So things that happen in your gut can affect your mood and, and, and how you feel. But, but the patients are struggling, they're embarrassed about their situation, they may not mm -hmm. seek health care from a doctor because of the embarrassment of what they're talking about. Or they saw a doctor and the doctor says, look, you know, 
go do yoga or or try to relax and and the patient's like what do you mean i i think i have something and and help me out but we now know in in 2022 that for ibs and SIBO, food poisoning started this whole thing that's a new thing so for your viewers if you haven't heard this if you got food poisoning from eating some bad food somewhere that can be or could have been the trigger that now led to this lifelong problem that you have and so those are the kinds of things we're exploring in, in our scientific efforts. And if let left untreated, does SIBO or IBS lead to other much scarier gastroenterology issues, cancer perhaps, or is this something that you're not quite sure yet? Well, let's start by saying IBS and SIBO are absolutely miserable. Imagine being at a restaurant, having the first few bites of a, uh, of a meal, and then you having to get up go to the bathroom for half an hour and you're on a date. So lifestyle is affected dramatically by this, especially in young people and people trying to you know, work. So it affects people dramatically. But what we do know is it doesn't lead necessarily to cancer or to some of the more dramatic um, life altering illnesses that, that I think you're alluding to. So you're not at higher risk for cancer if you have IBS, but you're sure miserable uh, right. you know, going about your business. Yeah, it's something you just don't want to deal with. Now, I know a lot of people probably listening have heard of IBS, and that can be a lot of different um, different symptoms. And it's sort of a broad term because there's lots of other lots of things that can be I IBS when it comes to your bathroom habits. But I want to start with SIBO because SIBO is something I think that a lot of people have never heard of. Um, I'll tell my really quick personal story. I was diagnosed with SIBO not long after I had my second baby, and it was during the pandemic. And much like you described, I went to the doctor. I actually it wasn't so much a physical thing. It was I couldn't sleep. I couldn't get to sleep. And I didn't know why. It was just, This was so bizarre. I couldn't. I it was always a good sleeper. And every doctor I saw said, well, you know, you're going through a pandemic. You're anchoring the news. You must be really stressed. You're raising a baby. And, you know, that's just what it is. And then I finally saw a functional doctor who, who gave me a bunch of tests, and one of them being a SIBO test. And turns out, my numbers were off the charts. And uh, I ended up taking a couple of antibiotics, one of which I believe your department developed. And, and it helped right away, but it's, it, there, it's more than just taking antibiotics. It's more than just doing all those different things. And we'll get to that in a minute. But first I would love it if you would tell our viewers what SIBO is and what causes it sometimes. So SIBO, I'm glad you're better, first of all. <laughs> say that. But SIBO is a very, uh, it's a little complicated because your gastrointestinal tract contains a lot of bacteria. But mm -hmm. when it goes much higher, and we now know the major culprits that make it go higher, but, but it goes much higher than the bacteria in your small intestine where you, it should be relatively clean. Let's say you ate a meal. The food's for you, not for them. And so if you have this excessive amount of bacteria in your yeah. small intestine, they're feasting every day. And mm -hmm. when they feast, they produce gas, bloating, they change um, your mood, they, they, they change your sleep in, in some instances, and, and of course your, your bowel habits. So that's really small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. But again, it's very, very common. We're talking about tens of millions of people in the U.S. that have this and can benefit from seeing a physician, get, from getting properly diagnosed. But we're, we're seeing that SIBO is now breaking down into sort of three subgroups. Mm -hmm. One is the methane kind, which is a particular type of gas. Another is hydrogen, and the third is hydrogen sulfide. And you have to check with your doctor to, to get the right therapy for the right type, and all of this continues to evolve. But it's very, very common. I'll say one more thing. Uh, one of the things we now know is about 60% of IBS is actually potentially SIBO. So if you have the label of IBS, it's always good to get a breath test just to know if it's not SIBO uh, causing your IBS symptoms. And with folks who are curious to know what the breath test is, it's, it's uh, I'll explain it very quickly. And if you can elaborate, doctor, it's basically you eat a certain amount of foods for uh, this a few hours before, and then the next day you have to take this breath test. It takes about two and a half hours or so, and uh, it's a bit of a pain, but it's absolutely worth it because you get to know a little bit more about yourself. And uh, and I I want to go in a little bit about the treatment of SIBO, and you know you talk about there there are uh, and I mentioned there are some antibiotics, but. It goes beyond that. It's not just sometimes you do really have to change your lifestyle. So can you tell me a little about how what lifestyle triggers can can cause SIBO 
and how to treat it. Well, once you have SIBO, it's really important to know that the bacteria are looking for your food because they're in the location where you're supposed to be getting it. So anything you give them that you don't digest it quick enough or you're, you can't quickly assimilate, they're sharing in that and they're producing a lot of their chemicals and gases and, 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 and bloating. And so all the symptoms are worsened. So lifestyle number one, first of all, the antibiotics work extremely well. But then to keep it well, because it can come back, uh, you, you have to adjust your diet. So eating le things that are le less absorbed is a bad thing. The case in point is non-digestible sugars. Sugars that make what you think is sugar-free is not sugar-free. It just contains the sugars humans can't eat or can't digest. But the bacteria love it. They get 100% of those calories. You get zero calories. Uh, beans, for example, are, and... and um, chickpeas, which are part of hummus, common things we eat, can really flare the bacteria even days later. Uh, I'll give you a little uh, really important sort of pearl. Patients say, well, you know, I had pasta last week. I did fine. I had pasta this week. I had diarrhea. But it's not the pasta. It could have been something you had two or three days ago that primed the bacteria up. So people are always thinking that was the last meal that caused the problem, but it could have been three meals back that caused the problem. The second thing I'll say is that, that the gut needs rest. And rest is not eating for periods of time. Because remember, a thousand years ago, you killed the animal, you ate the animal, you didn't have a refrigerator, and you waited two days mm -hmm. till the next hunt. And so the gut has to clean itself like a dishwasher. So the next time you eat, the plate is clean. So spacing between meals is part of this low fermentation eating. You eat things that don't ferment as much, and you space your meals nicely so that so that you have time to clean up between so the bacteria don't build up as much. Now, are you talking about intermittent fasting, or is this just throughout your day having three square meals a day and having, you know, three to four hours at least between those meals? Well, some people like to fast longer, and that can actually be better. But uh, what we sort of prescribe as part of low fermentation eating is you eat breakfast, then you wait four to five hours, then you eat lunch, then you wait four to five hours, and you eat dinner. And anything in between has to be either water or coffee or nothing with calories. Um, so uh, that that's how, that's what we find to work best for patients. But remember, a diet isn't, shouldn't be painful. I mean, you shouldn't restrict to the point where you can't go to a restaurant. And so part of what we sort of talk about is the, the list should include that you could go to any restaurant in the country and get a meal and not have to ask the waiter 20 questions when you're with your friends um, to try and figure out what to eat. Right. Now, uh, you wrote this book, The Microbiome Connection, Your Guide to IBS, SIBO, and Low Fermentation Eating. Now, I've never heard of low fermentation eating before. It's fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what that means? Well, uh, I've given you some examples already uh, of things that you shouldn't eat, the beans the sugars that are not absorbed, but high fiber diet. I know everybody's going to think, well, what is he saying? You want a low fiber diet, but in patients with SIBO, high fiber diet means all those non-digestible long chain sugars, the bacteria mm -hmm. get it all and you don't get it. Uh, but then they start to produce more bacteria and then the symptoms are worse. So it's eating foods that are easy to absorb and digest. Like, for example, rice and potatoes and vegetables that are from the ground. Uh, roots and fruit vegetables are easier to digest than the leafy. So you still get vegetables. You still mm -hmm. can, can have a balanced diet, but you're mm -hmm. selecting things that are easier to absorb for humans. And therefore, um, you know, don't go to the bacteria. And so that's, that's the low fermentation eating sort of in a nutshell. When I think of fermentation, the first thing I thought of, though, was wine and alcohol. Yeah. Are those things that you can incorporate into this diet? I, I, I can't imagine those are probably great for the gut, but, but maybe, <laughs> maybe there's a chance that you can have a little. Who knows? And the answer is yes, because it's already all fermented, so there's nothing left to ferment. In fact, alcohol can kill bacteria, as we all know. I'm not purporting or suggesting people drink alcohol, but alcohol is completely okay on this diet. Okay. Now, I, I want to go back to um, a little bit about lifestyle kind of choices, even though maybe you're not going to go through with the SIBO test, maybe you're not going to go see a doctor. But I, I'm wondering if there is an ideal, I mean, this is the low fermentation diet, great for folks with SIBO, but what about just in general, the right diet people should be eating 
for your gut health. You know, you hear a lot about these different probiotics and supplements, and you also hear about different fruits and veggies that you should be eating. What's the right What's the right diet to kind of make everything as, as healthy as possible? Is there one? Well, let me give you an example. Normal healthy people really don't need to do much except live a balanced, eat a balanced diet and live a healthy lifestyle. I think if your gut is healthy and you're feeling normal, um, you know, I'm not saying don't rock the boat. What I'm saying is you're doing all the right things and you don't need to do too much more. It's people who are unhealthy that need to make these modifications. And there isn't the one size fits all, but generally speaking, the gut has a particular function. It digests and then it cleans. It digests and then it cleans. So you have to follow that function. So eat and then don't eat for periods of time. We spend time in offices and there's the room with bagels sitting on the counter all day. There's the chips, there's a candy bowl. Maybe we shouldn't be reaching for those calories. And I don't mean for obesity reasons, but because every time you eat those things, your gut stops cleaning itself. And so you need those spaces between meals to have a healthy lifestyle, even for normal people. So do you think that there's a reason why some of these gut-related issues are on the rise, like IBS and SIBO? Do you believe that it's because we just, because of the pandemic, or maybe just in the past five, ten years, people are eating differently or less healthily? What do you think is attributed to that rise? Well, we know that food poisoning triggers a lot of these things, and maybe there's more of that these days than there was previously. But, but I think, honestly, it's more recognition of these conditions. You know, the word microbiome didn't start till 2003, and there's been a lot of hot research in this area for the last 15 years, and I think the awareness, uh, you know, has gone up. So mm-hmm. I think it has a lot to do with just more awareness. Physicians are more aware, and they aren't kind of dismissing patients as, as you know, it's, it's psychological or that, you know, you need to just relax and things will get better. They're, they're actually now looking and finding, and, and I think that is another reason. But, but let me speak to the pandemic. The funny story is a lot of my IBS patients and patients with SIBO were actually better during the pandemic because they were eating at home. They controlled their diet perfectly. When you go to a restaurant, you can ask questions and, and sort of get a handle on things, but you don't really know. But at home, you really know. And so they were controlling their diets better and things were somewhat better. So I guess it depends on who you are and, and how you handle cooking at home. <laughs> and hopefully you're, you're following your rules for, for low fermentation eating. Your book is called The Microbiome Connection, Your Guide to IBS, SIBO, and Low Fermentation Eating. So many people are, are, are suffering with these issues. It's so nice to see that there's a resource out there. Is there anything that we missed that you'd like to cover in this conversation that you think might be helpful to folks out there? You know, I I just like to end with a note of optimism. I think now that we understand this condition more, now that we're recognizing it more, there's a lot of new therapies coming. So people who have this, people who struggle with it, and maybe the antibiotics don't work, don't lose hope because there's really a lot of things emerging and and there'll be many things in the coming years that will be a benefit to this condition. That is great, great news. All right, Dr. Mark Pimentel, thank you so much. Nice to talk to you.